Hello, church. How you doing? Uh, for the record, working with Luke Crowley is incredible. Stop it. Stop it. Move on. Uh, one of my favorite things about him is uh, are his dance moves. And uh, so next week, we are going to find that dance floor. So if you were like, whatever, about coming to church, you know, whatever, Christmas services, come for the party in between because Luke's going to break it down. Are you? You have to now. I said it. <laughs> you can all have to take a seat. It's good to be in church. Ruth Smith. Hi, Ruthie. I just want to say happy birthday. I know it was your birthday this week. And when we were standing there worship, I just uh, looked over at you and thought, I just want to take a moment and honor you and show you love. And you are um, as sweet as they come. I think one of my favorite things about you is uh, how you laugh out loud in service. You're like the best person to be up here with because you're like, someone laughed. Um, you love to laugh, but at the same time, you have such a, a, a wisdom, a godly wisdom in you. And I know that behind the scenes and in the quiet and from Sunday to Sunday, you don't do that. You're going to make me do that. Um, but you, you, you encourage and uplift. And I, I, a girl came up to me and said, I, you know, I just I wanted to learn more about the Bible. And someone told me, go to Ruthie because she'll, she'll help walk me through it. So thank you for not only who you are, not only what you do here on every sun, week to week on Sundays, but what you do in between. You're a blessing. I love you. You ready for the word? I'm ready. Ephesians 6, beginning in verse 10, it says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything, to stand. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. On that note, let's pray. Jesus, thank you for today. Thank you for this opportunity to gather in your house. In your word, it says, with two more gathered in your name, you were there with them. So I thank you, God, that you've come to meet with us. Lord, I pray that we have open hearts and soft hearts and open ears to your word. And I pray, Lord, that I only speak what you have me say. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. Have you ever thought that Christians were a bit weird? Okay, I, I grew up in church. I'm a pastor's kid, a church kid through and through. Some of my earliest memories are in church. Um, I sat in so many services. I slept on floors. I slept in pews. I slept in restaurant booths after service. So many Mondays, my mom would let us stay home from school because we stayed up so late in church on Sunday night. That was my childhood, and I loved it. My mom and dad, like I said, are pastors, and they're incredible. They're so full of faith, and to this day, they still uh, encourage and inspire me in my faith. And so and to top that all off, they're, they're not weird. They're like really not weird. They're really normal. So that's, that's really great. I say all that to say, set myself up for this. Sometimes Christians can be weird. Like sometimes we can be overly spiritual. Like we can over-spiritualize things. Are you with me? For example, I vividly remember having a conversation with a girl, and she was clearly sick. Like she was congested. Um, she had a raspy voice, she was coughing, and the nose was running, and I was like, are you feeling okay? And she was like, I am great, I am healthy and whole, I am healed by the stripes of Jesus, he took my disease, he took my sickness, I am great. And I was like, 
okay. <laughs> now hear me out. I know that our words are powerful. The Bible says that I'm not making fun. But sometimes I just feel like we could just have an honest answer. Like, yeah, I'm not feeling great. I believe that God can heal me. I'm praying and believing that he will heal me. But I'm not feeling great. Or uh, the, the statement, the enemy is just really attacking me. That's so cringy to me. Like, so cringy. For example, like, the enemy's really attacking my finances. Like, no, the enemy's not attacking your finances. You make this much, and you spend this much. It's not rocket science. You are your own enemy. So because of, because of this, okay, this is my journey. I under-spiritualize things. I, I be, I didn't, because I didn't want to be like that. I didn't want to be a weird Christian. I under-spiritualize things. So if I was having a hard time in my finances, I'd say I should just be better with my finances. Or if I was having a hard time in my marriage, I would say, you know what, we, we just need to work on our communication. If I was facing a challenge, I would say it's just it's life. Like things happen. And that's true. There's truth to that. It is life, and things do happen, and it's not perfect, and it never will be perfect. But in this passage of Scripture, Paul reminds us that there's something else happening at the same time. Over the past couple of years, to be honest with you, this, this message comes from one of the most intimate uh, lessons in, in, my, in my walk and, and journey with God there is a spiritual battle. Things don't just happen. Life isn't just complicated. Have you ever been guilty of using the phrase, not to be spiritual, but I said that, like not to be spiritual, but, and then, you know, like I'm normal, like don't think I'm weird. I'm not trying to be obvious, but not to be spiritual, but, but the truth is we are spiritual. We are a spirit. In the, the very first, first book of the Bible, in Genesis, we see that God created man out of the dust of the earth. It said he formed him out of the earth, and he blew the breath of life into him. Our body houses our spirit. Our spirit is the real us. In 2 Corinthians, my pants are falling down. In 2 Corinthians 4 verse 18, it says, so we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. This earthly experience is temporary. The Bible says it's like a vapor. It's a, it's a tiny bit of our life. But what is unseen, the spirit world, that is what is eternal. So we read here in Ephesians 6, verse 12, it says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. You see, we have a God who created us, a God who loves us, a God who, who wants to give us life and life in abundance. And we also have an enemy, an enemy who's come to steal and to kill and to destroy. Both of those are happening at the same time. And so God tells us, he gives us, he gives us a heads up. This, this passage of scripture gives them some insight into that. God tells us there's going to be a battle to expect it, to anticipate it, and then there's a way to stand firm through it. And the title of my message today is Stand Firm. So how do we stand firm? We all want to stand firm. Well, first, in order to stand firm, you have to understand that God is your source. Verse 10 says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Be strong in the Lord and in his power. His power, not mine, not my strength, not my power. God is your source. And you know what? He wants to be your source. I have four young kids. And um, uh, this made me, preparing this message made me think about cooking with them. You know, sometimes I'll go and say, I'm going to make banana bread. And then my four-year-old will come in the kitchen. And he's like, can I help you? And inside, I'm like, no, it's too much work. And it slows me down. But he's so cute. And he's adorable. And he's got these chubby little hands. I'm like, yes, of course, you can help me. And so we get started, and he tries to break an egg. I don't know if you've ever seen a kid try to break an egg, but 
It's a riot. And so he breaks the egg and all the shell goes into the bowl and all the egg goes outside of the bowl. And then we put the flour in and then flour goes everywhere. And then we, once all the ingredients are in, he goes to stir it. And as he stirs it, it's like, it's like snow in my kitchen. So pro tip, if you're cooking with a young child, always do the first stir for them and then let them do the rest so that your, your kitchen isn't a mess. And of course, once that banana bread is baked and everyone goes to eat it, you better believe that he tells everyone that he made that banana bread. And I'm like, he did. He did it all. And it just makes me think of us because as humans, and I think especially here in L.A., we are so used to doing things for ourselves. We are go-getters, we are self-starters, we are motivated, we are ladder climbers, we are ambitious, we are dream chasers. We believe that with grit, anything is possible. We're so conditioned to doing it ourselves. But, you know, I, I don't know about you, but I, sometimes I go to God when I can't figure it out on my own. Like, I got it, I got it, I got it, God, I got it, God. Oh, wait, I don't, hey, can you help me because I don't have it anymore? And we've got that backwards. God wants to be part of all of it. He wants to be our source. You know, going to God and saying, God, I want you to be my source, it's not a sign of weakness. It's a sign of strength. And can I tell you, it's the most freeing feeling in the world. When you go, I don't have to figure it all out. I don't have to do it all on my, all in my own strength. I don't have to climb every ladder or open every door. I just go, God, I invite you in. I live this life in your strength. I know that you have a plan and a purpose for me, and I'm going to be a go-getter, and I'm going to go after it, and I'm going to give it everything I got. But at the same time, I know you're right there with me, opening the right doors, closing the wrong ones in Jesus' name. He's your source. He wants to help you. He will lead you and he will guide you. He will uphold you. He will protect you. He loves you. He's for you and he has a plan for you. You can stand firm knowing that God is your source. You can also stand firm knowing that he's given you everything that you need. Verse 11 says, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. To stand firm, we put on the armor of God. His armor. He says, stand firm, rely on me, I'm your strength, here's what you need, now put it on. Reese, have you ever packed wrong for a trip? A few weeks ago, I went to Florida for the weekend. My family's lived in Florida for over 20 years. Like, the weather in Florida is always the same. It's 80s and 90s and 100% humidity, except for like three days out of the year. So, I re- rookie move, I did not check the weather app. So I packed for this trip. I packed one pair of jeans for church while I was there, and then shorts, t-shirts, flip-flops, and a swimsuit. And I don't know if you've ever been to Florida, but when you step out of the the airplane into the terminal, it's freezing cold, like freezing. They pump, because it's so hot outside, they make you freezing inside. Like if you go to the movie theater in Florida, you always take a sweater because you're going to be freezing. It doesn't make sense. Anyway, so you, you do that, freezing cold. And then as you walk toward those double doors to head, to exit, The doors open and this this wave of heat and humidity just like hit you in the face. And you're like, that's Florida. I'm in Florida. So I deboard the plane. I walk through the terminal, freezing cold. I go toward the double doors. And as they open up, cold air hits me in the face. And I was like, did I get off the plane in the wrong place? Like, where am I? So I check my weather app. And there's a cold front in, in Florida. And so it's colder than here and rainy the whole weekend. So needless to say, I wore my sweatpants that I wore on the plane and the jeans that I packed the entire weekend. I did not touch the shorts. I did not touch the t-shirts. I did not touch the flip-flops. And I definitely did not touch the swimsuit. God has not given you a swimsuit to retire by the pool. He's given you armor And the reason he's given you armor is because there's a battle ahead to fight. So you put on the armor and you fight the good fight of faith. We're not struggling. We're fighting. We can expect it. Don't be discouraged when you face trials, when you face battle. God warned you, but it's okay because he's given you everything that you need. He's given you the tools. So let's talk through the tools for a second. Let's talk through this armor. You're like, wait, what am I putting on? A swimsuit, what? It says, let's go back to the verse. 
Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, which which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows. Take up the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, and prayer. Okay, so there's seven things. We're going to talk through them for a few minutes. The belt of truth. The belt of truth is God's word. God's word is truth. There's nothing fake or lie in it. John 17, verse 17 says, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. And knowing God's word is what enables us to withstand and reject the lies of the enemy, he whispers to us. I had a a conversation with a friend last week, and she was just, she was feeling really down and discouraged, and she said, you know, I feel like what I do doesn't matter. I feel like what I bring to the table isn't very significant, um, that what I, what I spend my days on and my weeks on, like, what difference does it really make? And so we talked, and I said it before, like, wait, be honest. Be honest with the emotions. Be honest with how you feel. We talked through that together. And then at the end, I just said to her, I just want you to know you're allowed to feel this way, but I just want to remind you that it's all lies. It is not true. Not only is it all lies, it's actually The exact opposite. If you knew who I was talking about, you'd be like, my mind is blown. Like, how can she feel that way? Because everywhere she goes, she makes a difference. Everything she does, what she does day in and day out, week in and week out, is so significant. That actually made me angry that she was feeling that way. When the enemy tells you you lie, the Holy Spirit brings to remembrance the truth of God's word, and we're able to decipher the truth of God's word from the lies of the enemy. What he whispers about you, about your situation, about your future, about your family, about your marriage, about your purpose, about your value, the belt of truth, God's word, is part of the armor that he's given us. Next is the breastplate of righteousness. Righteousness means being made right. I love Psalm 23, verse 23. It says, the Lord guides us in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. God is so kind to us. He didn't just save us, but he guides us in the path of righteousness. He shows you the way. Um, You may have heard part of this story before, but I moved to LA when I was 22, moved away from family, like most of us, moved here with, with no one else here, no one holding me accountable, like no one being like, Did you go to church on Sunday? Nothing. And so I realized probably six months or a year to living in L.A., um, year in, that nobody was going to do it if I wasn't going to. Like if I didn't want to serve God, no one was going to say any different. I felt like I'd been living in such a gray area for so long. And at the same time, I felt like I, I I just couldn't figure things out. Like, I, I want, God, I love you, and I want to live for you, but I can't figure out how to fix these things or how to not struggle with these things or not want these things. And so I had this very honest just moment with God where I said, Jesus, I want you. I want you. I don't know how to fix it. I don't know how to change myself, but I want you. And, um, and I looked back six months later. And realized things I was struggling with, I wasn't struggling with anymore. Things that I felt drawn to, I had no desire for anymore. In that, in, that, in that earnest moment of going, God, I want you, it allowed him to do an inner transformation in my heart that I could never have done on my own. And also, he never asked me to do. Are there things we can do? Yes. Are there better choices we can make? Sure. But I just want to remind you that you are not your savior. That God never asked you to fix yourself or change yourself. That this is not a behavior modification program. When we have this posture of, God, I want you, it allows him in to do, to, to bring us to righteousness. He'll guide you in the path of righteousness. He'll show you how to live a righteousness that protects your heart and your life. The next thing Paul mentions is ready feet. Feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. The gospel is 
The good news is the gospel of peace. This good news of Jesus who came and died on the cross to reconcile my life with God, that is the good news. I love how the Amplified Bible says it. It says, And having strapped on your feet the gospel of peace in preparation to face the enemy with firm-footed stability and the readiness produced by the good news. We run this race. We live this life. We go into battle with the word of God, the good news, as our foundation. The good news produces readiness. We can face the enemy with this firm-footed stability and readiness because of the good news we've built our life on, the foundation we've built it on. Again, not in our strength, not in our ability to fight, not in our strong will or toughness or stick to We can face the enemy with this posture and with this mindness and with this readiness because we have firmly planted our lives on the truth of God's word, on the hope of salvation, on the promises of God for this life and a life in eternity with him. Next, Paul mentions the shield of faith. Uh, and the Roman soldier had two kinds of shield. He had a smaller shield that he could move or re- maneuver really easily in, in um, like hand-to-hand combat. And then he had a bigger shield. And this is the one that Paul is talking, referring to, talking about. This is the one, it was, it was big and oblong, it was like four and a half feet high by two feet wide, and the Roman soldiers would use those, link up together as they, as they went into battle. And so it would be, it would create an impenetrable wall. Our shield against Satan's arrows is this kind of faith, faith that God can be trusted, faith that we have full coverage, that we do not need to fear when we advance into battle. God is with us, and he will bring the victory. Faith itself is not what protects us. It's it's as we engage our faith, as we activate the power and complete protection of the almighty God. Our faith enables us to engage with God and what he is doing on our behalf in the unseen. Next up, The helmet of salvation is the final piece of the armor, and this helmet protects one of the most vulnerable parts of our body. The assurance of our salvation is our impenetrable defense against anything that the enemy throws at us. Salvation brings us into relationship with Jesus. It made us his heirs. It freed us from the curse of sin and death. Jesus already won the victory on the cross. So no matter what the enemy throws at you, you can face him with confidence that Jesus has already won the fight. And I love that the, that the armor begins and ends with the word of God. It begins with the belt of truth, which is the word of God, and it ends with the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So we've talked about it already, but God's truth, God's word is the truth, and it's living in you. And like I said, as the enemy comes against you and fills your head and your heart with lies, God's word pierces through those lies with the truth of his word. And finally, prayer. And pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayer and requests. Victory in spiritual warfare is inseparable from prayer. Prayer changes things. Can I be real with you? Uh, Sometimes I don't feel like praying. Like especially about things that I've already prayed for. Like God, I already prayed for that. I'm tired. I'm tired of praying for it. And Philippians 4 verse 6 says, don't worry about anything, but instead pray in everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. And I wouldn't consider myself as someone who worries, but sometimes I think about it and I think about it and I process it and I talk about it and I think about it and I wake up in the night thinking about it and I wake up in the morning thinking about it and I think to myself, have I ever once prayed about it? Prayer is significant. Prayer changes things. Prayer can shift the atmosphere. It sets the miraculous into motion. It sets into motion the living God and his angels on your behalf. How awesome is that? It invites God to do the supernatural in your life. Again, him being your source. You go to him and he does things you could never, ever do on your own, nor would I want to. Don't put on worry. Don't put on anxiety. It doesn't look good on you. Put on the armor of God. Amen? So we stand firm knowing that God is our source. 
We stand firm knowing that he's given us everything we need. And we stand firm with a posture of faith. Faith has a posture. In this passage of scripture, it keeps coming back to stand, stand, stand firm, stand firm-footed, stand. It has a posture. There's a, this boy on my son's baseball team. He's an incredible athlete, 12 years old, insane athlete. Um, he, he's the kid who, when he comes out onto the field, like, I feel so bad for the opposing team. You can see them kind of just, you know, cower back, and then you hear their coaches pick it up, and they're like, you're great. You got this. Like, you got, you're going to be great. You can do this. You're know, like really trying to build him up. And this kid steps up to bat, and, man, he hits home run after home run after home run. And then when he pitches, no chance anyone is hitting one of those balls that he pitches. He's just so good. But the thing that stands out to me the most about him is his demeanor. He's 12, but he comes onto that field like, I've got this. I am ready. I am prepared. So we found that he has an athletic um, coach. And so this coach came to practice, and I was like, tell me you're an athletic coach without telling me you're an athletic coach. The guys were in, like, all workout clothes, compression pants, a sweater that I'm pretty sure said something like, all we do is win, and a bandana, you know, like, full on, I'm like this guy. But his dad was telling us, his boy's dad was telling us that while this coach works on skill with him, what he works on more is demeanor. How you carry yourself. He is intimidating. He's a really nice kid, by the way. Super encouraging. He's not mean, but he's intimidating. He walks on that field and man, people are intimidated. Posture matters. It matters. Faith has a posture. Standing firm is a posture of readiness. It is sure-footed. It is a posture ready to go into battle, a posture that anticipates what's ahead, a posture that is poised and ready and unintimidated by the opponent. You know, Paul is using the comparison to a soldier here. You know, a soldier in battle is not going to turn his back, sit crisscross applesauce, on the ground and chill? No. He's up. He's facing his opponent. He has his armor on, and he goes in ready for battle. First Peter 5, verse 8 to 9 says, Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. He's not sitting back relaxing. He's coming after you. He's on the prowl. And this is where our part comes in. God is our strength. God is our source. We have everything we need. So put in the armor and stand firm on the Word of God, the foundation of your life. And not just stand, but stand with a posture of faith, of confidence, of expectation, and of strength. Not because of your power and strength but because you put on the armor of God. You've used the tools he's given you because God is on your side. This is where you actively stand with firm-footed stability, ready to fight. Stand with a posture of faith. I'm ready. Joshua 1 verse 9 says, Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. The Lord will be with you wherever you go. You are not alone in your battle. You are not alone in what you face. God is with you. Proverbs 3.26 says, For the Lord will be your confidence and will keep your foot from being caught. You can stand with this posture, with this confidence, because God is with you. You can have confidence that runs so much deeper than yourself and your abilities. And then I want to close with this. It says, and after done all this, wait, let me get it right. And after you have done all this, to stand. Why don't you stand with me? Speaking of standing, now I want to remind you, it says, after you have done all this, to stand. And I want to remind you that you will stand. You will stand. 
I don't know what you're facing. I don't know what you're going to face. Uh, I'm not breaking any news I haven't already said, but you will face something. You will if you're not already. And I want to remind you that God is with you, that He's for you, that He is your source, that you can rely on Him, that He's given you everything you need, that as you put on this armor, that you will stand, that you're going to be okay, that God is with you, and that He has already won the victory. You're not doing it alone. Amen? Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for today. Lord, I thank you that you are a source. I thank you that you're with us and you're for us. I thank you that you lead us and guide us, God. I thank you that you make our paths straight. And Lord, I pray that whatever we face, whatever people are facing right now, that seems too difficult. Lord, I pray that you encourage them and remind them that you're with them, that you're for them, that you're working on their behalf, that your plans for them are good, plans to prosper them and not to harm them, plans for a hope and a future in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, that we can stand firm with you. I pray for all that's ahead of us. Lord, I pray that whenever and wherever and however we face challenge, that we're reminded of this word, Ephesians 6, in Jesus' name. We love you, Lord. We thank you for being with us. We thank you for caring about us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.